Welcome ladies and gentlemen to the SEMA strategic case study financial strategy or F3 essentials refresher segment 2 part 2 which will be about capital structure. Right. Let's take a look. So before I dive into the content I'd like to remind you Again, to be prepared with a notebook and a pen on the ready, if you may please, do follow the slides and my explanations carefully. Take notes, maintain a list of doubts or clarifications. Do maintain a list of key topics that you feel you're weak at, so you can self-revise immediately or later using the pause button, either way, and do make sure that you stay focused. With that, let's proceed. You know the co-activity and uh, because I reminded you this in the previous segment, let me start talking about capital structure. So this is pretty much the mix of debt and equity, you know, the, uh, figuring out the structure of your capital, how exactly or to what extent are you going to have uh, debt versus the extent of equity that you're going to use as funding for your company. Now, as far as capital stru structure is concerned, we talk about the impact of capital structure on the weighted average cost of capital of the company. We also look at some of the perspectives, various opinions of economists and people who have done extensive thoughts and research on this, especially Modigliani and Miller's view with tax and without tax, also the traditional view in terms of the optimal gearing position, right? Now, this is the formula for the weighted average cost of capital. You know that it takes, it basically is a weightage, a blended weightage of your cost of equity based on the weight of equity that you have in your company and the post-tax cost of debt based on the cost of debt or based on the extent of debt that you have in your company. It is clear that if a company changes its capital structure or gearing level, the WACC will change. Since the ratio of debt to equity is a key variable in the formula. Also the value of an entire company that is debt plus equity can be calculated as the present value of its post tax operating cash flows before financing discounted at the VAC or the weighted average cost of capital. And therefore, when the weighted average cost of, cost of capital changes, the business value also changes, right? So this has direct implications to the value of a business. What capital structure should the company aim for in order to maximize the company's value? That becomes a primary question when we think about capital structure, right? What structure leads us to aiming or leads us to establishing the maximum value of the company. Now, several studies such as the traditional view, MM without tax, MM with tax exist. To understand the views, it is vital to understand the two opposing forces which impact on the VAC as capital structure changes. Now, what are these opposing forces? The first one is the downward force. It's the idea that debt is cheaper than equity, so you introduce more debt and your weighted average cost of capital will fall. Whereas the upward force is that the cost of equity increases because of higher perceived risk and therefore WACC would increase. So imagine a situation where, introducing you, where you are introducing more debt. Fundamentally because debt is cheaper than equity in terms of financing cost, right? Because interest is tax deductible, it will reduce your cost of capital. But while that is happening, your equity owners, shareholders will perceive the business as more risky because the lenders and the debt proportion come before them. They are prioritized, right? And therefore, in, the, in, the, in terms of, uh, I would say even in terms of pecking order, when it comes to uh, a situation where the company is winding up, lenders are always above ordinary shareholders in terms of their rights of recovery. So that will lead them to perceiving the company as a higher risk and therefore the cost of equity will increase and therefore the weighted average cost of capital will increase. So we see this idea of two opposing forces with the injection of more debt. 
clearly the two factors identified have opposing impacts on the weighted average cost of capital. So the key questions are which of the two forces is stronger? What is the net effect of these two factors? And there is really no simple answer to these questions. In fact, the different gearing theories propose completely different answers to these questions based on different assumptions. Right. And that is what we should be able to really gauge. An understanding of these two factors and these key questions is crucial to a sound understanding of the capital structure theories. So I know that uh, these traditional views and MM theories are really very theoretical when it comes to the practical world. Right? What I mean is not that they are difficult, but what I mean is that some of them seem improbable or impractical, not, you know, they don't exist in the real world. But to understand capital structure and to understand these different forces, understand how cost of capital can behave with the, uh, with the injection and the association of different sources of capital, we have to uh, have, a ta have to take a good look at all these theories and we will. First of all, the traditional view of gearing and the cost of capital. So here you basically see the cost of capital graph. This is the cost of equity. Uh, this is the cost of debt and you have the cost of capital here, which is the blend of cost of equity and cost of debt and you basically have the optimal gearing point. X is the optimal level of gearing where cost of equity or oh, sorry, where KO which is the weighted average cost of capital is at a minimum. The traditional view therefore claims that there is an optimal capital structure where the weighted average cost of capital is at a minimum. This is at point X in the above diagram. At point X, the overall return required by investors, that is debt and equity, is minimized. So what you notice is that as gearing is increased, cost of debt remains stable, but after a certain point, cost of debt starts to rise. Right? Similarly, as gearing is increased, cost of equity is also increasing because shareholders are perceiving the business to be um, a higher risk venture right? and this is what we get as a result of that blend. It follows that at this point the combined market value of the entity's debt and equity securities will also be maximized because the value of the entity's debt and equity and the weighted average cost of capital are inversely related. Discounting the future operating cash flows at a lower cost of capital will give a higher value. And that is what leads to this X marks the spot x being the optimal level of gearing and the traditional view believes that traditional view proposes that there is for every company there is an optimal level of gearing now let's look at modigliani and miller without tax the 1958 proposition was that companies which operate in the same type of business which have similar operating risks must have the same total value irrespective of their capital structures, right? Same type of business, similar risks must have the same total value. Their view is based on the, I know a little bit uh, far-fetched, no? But their view is based on the belief that the value of a company depends solely upon the future post-tax pre-financing operating income generated by its assets. And the way in which the funding is split between debt and equity should make no difference to the total value. In fact, one of M&M's assumptions is that the investors are indifferent between personal and corporate gearing, right? So this is actually based heavily on a lot of assumptions. Thus, the total value of the company will not change with gearing. This means that its weighted average cost of capital will not change with gearing and will be the same at all levels of gearing. And their view is represented on the following diagrams, right? So this idea that gearing or capital structure is not sensitive to or rather the weighted average cost of capital the weighted average cost of capital is not sensitive to the capital structure of the company and the cost of capital is only dependent and as a result the value of the company is only dependent solely upon the future post tax pre-interest operating income was that key assumption as the 
key tool that is being used to value the company and that is why whatever happens whatever capital structure you have m and m without tax says that the total market value of a business remains indifferent to gearing levels that brings us to mm with tax so in 1963 that was done in 1958 right so by 1963 mm amended their model to include the impact of corporation tax this alteration changes the results of their analysis significantly <laughs> fair enough Previously, they argued that companies that differ only in their capital structure should have the same total value of debt plus equity, right? As we saw, this was because it was the size of a firm's operating earnings stream that determines its value and not the way the funding was split. However, the corporation tax system carries a distortion under which returns to debt holders or interest are tax deductible, whereas returns to equity holders are not. Modigliani and Miller therefore conclude that geared companies have an advantage over ungeared companies that is they pay less tax and will therefore have a greater market value and a lower weighted average cost of capital they simply said that because interest is tax deductible companies that are geared are at an advantage over companies that are not geared right so they say that introducing more debt means cheaper cost of capital because interest is tax deductible so it's a good thing in the presence of tax, the downward force on the VAC, the impact of the greater proportion of debt finance is stronger than the upward force. So Modigliani Miller's theory with tax proposes that the downward, downward force of VAC, which is the cheaper uh, financing element related to debt is greater and therefore the net effect is more toward the downward force than the upward force. How is this determined? This is what we, what happens. As you can see, uh, cost of weighted average cost of capital. What happens is with gearing, they say that the cost of capital will decrease of the company, and therefore, as gearing increases, the value of the business increases. So these are just three perspectives, three theoretical perspectives of how m uh, how the VAC and its association to or the capital structure and its association to corporate value or business value is looked at. So here as gearing increases the VAC steadily decreases and hence the value of the company increases right that is what MM with tax proposes. Now you can take a look at all these assumptions right and uh, the SEMA strategic case study is not one to deal with a uh, deal heavily in many of these theoretical areas but you can and I advise that you take a good look at all these points I included them because they are a good revision tool and it would be prudent for you to read them but I do want to look at the practical considerations in reality lenders will ask for higher interest if they perceive that there is a greater risk of default this then leaves the problem of how companies determine their capital structures in the real world so now let's 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 get real the main practical considerations are the company's ability to borrow money that is the company's debt capacity the existing debt covenants the increasing costs of debt finance as gearing rises views of other stakeholders and rating agencies and tax exhaustion these are some of the key considerations we looked at in segment 2 part 1 when we took a close look at debt financing correct and therefore make sure that you are always aware that in the practical world in the real life when you determine capital structure there are so many considerations so many areas that we must be carefully evaluating and analyzing before we make final decisions now i would like to take your attention to the cap m model or uh, basically a model that helps us determine cost of equity right the capital asset pricing model the CAPM enables us to calculate the required return from an investment given the level of risk associated with the investment which is measured by its beta factor. And the CAPM model enables us to calculate the required return for a well diversified investor who is not subject to any unsystematic risk. Right? So the portfolio is diversified and therefore the unsystematic risk is uh, almost, almost zero. <laughs> 
if we can measure the systematic risk of a company or investment the capm will enable us to calculate the level of required return so the capital asset pricing model is really a, a more suitable model to a company that is or to a shareholder that is well diversified with a minimal or almost zero amounts of unsystematic or specific risk the capm gives a required return for a given level of risk which is uh, indicative from the beta factor therefore if we can estimate the level of risk associated with an entity the beta of the entity right we can use capm to give a required return to shareholders this required return to shareholders is essentially the cost of equity which can then be used to derive an appropriate vac for the entity and there you go that is the capm formula not that you will get to use this at the scs but knowing it is important um, knowing that cost of equity can be derived using the capital asset pricing model and all these points i touched on of how unsystematic risk has risk has to be diversified and how beta is used as an indicator of risk are all important information important awareness factors for the case study student so here cost of equity is the required return from the individual security beta is the beta of the security rf is risk free rate of interest rm is the return on market portfolio so what exactly is the beta factor a quick recap on that the method adopted by capm to measure systematic risk is an index right which is beta the beta factor is the measure of a share's volatility in terms of market risk so in relation to the market what is our risk that is what it means the beta factor of the market as a whole is 1 market risk makes market returns volatile and the beta factor is simply a yardstick against which the risk of other investments can be measured right so it's it's a it's a multiple of 1 so there are four categories if beta is greater than 1 it means that the shares have more systematic risk than the stock market average where so remember systematic risk is the the general business environment associated risk right not the specific risk because in in capm we assume that the unsystematic risk the specific risk has been diversified well enough through the portfolio when beta is equal to one the shares have the same systematic risk as the stock market average when beta is less than one the shares have less systematic risk than the stock market average and when beta is zero the shares have no risk at all right the the assumption is that it is a completely well diversified portfolio which is almost never the case because if that is the case what happens is in the formula when beta is zero cost of equity will become rf and this entire area will be zero right which means the shareholders required rate of return is basically the risk free rate of return nothing more nothing less why invest in shares then? All right, the beta factor is critical to applying the cap It illustrates the relationship of an individual security to the market as a whole, or conversely, the market return relative to the individual security. There we go. Right? So that is a quick idea and recap on the beta factor. Now, what happens to ratio analysis when we change the financing structure or the gearing ratio now the two key measures of gearing right these are very important because even in the pre-seen analysis we try and determine the capital structure it's just a simple calculation right it's one ratio but that number is useful right knowing how the company's capital structure is um, divided is, is a very important idea that we used to work with so capital gearing is equal to debt over debt plus equity or debt over equity right either way note both of these measures are used in practice but the first one is more commonly used we will calculate both when and if and when you do the analysis of the pre-seen and clearly if an entity changes its capital structure by raising new finance as either debt or equity these gearing ratios will change and you do know and we do did look at the idea that gearing or ratios can be used as metrics to retain covenants retain restrictions to a company that is trying to either change its capital structure inject more debt or even go for uh, further refinancing all these different options what about covenants then 
right? What are covenants and how do, uh, what exactly do we, should we know about covenants? Now, debt covenants are a useful application of the impact of financing decision on ratio analysis is in the context of this, right? For example, the gearing ratio is often used in covenants where an entity might have to keep its gearing ratio below a given percentage to comply with its debt covenants. If you are asked in the exam to assess the impact of a decision on a given debt covenant, you should calculate the necessary ratio assuming the decision has been made and then compare the result to the given target and that is ideally F3 OTQ level but as far as covenants are concerned, banks or financiers use the gearing ratio to track and establish various targets as points, you know, 20%, 30%, 40%, various stages of debt covenants in managing the entire loan. Next, we will look at key considerations related to capital structure, right? So there are a few important aspects. One is obviously tax issues. Within a group of companies, it makes sense to maximize borrowings in regimes with the highest tax rate to increase the amount of tax relief available. Tax relief can be limited though by transfer pricing issues and by thin capitalization rules, which we will look at. So if we are introducing, if we want to introduce more debt, if we want to have a capital structure with more debt, it would be prudent or it would it might it might be useful to have more debt to inject more debt from countries with uh, especially if you are a multinational corporation in countries with higher tax rates because then the tax benefit becomes high but so many aspects to consider and remember treasury is the function that we will use or the treasury function will actually analyze this and undertake all these responsibilities then the type of finance provided by the parent. Note that if debt and equity are both supplied by the parent company, the choice between debt and equity finance for a subsidiary has no cash implications in the context of groups, unlike the situation for a single company, right? That is if the debt and equity are both supplied by the parent company, right? So then doesn't really make much of a difference. This is because both are financed in cash by the parent and therefore can be funded by the parent by either debt or equity. The choice of capital structure for a subsidiary is therefore independent of the decision regarding the appropriate group capital structure. So subsidiary's capital structure is completely independent, has nothing to do with the group capital structure and the group capital structure is usually what we are worried about, right? given that the subsidiary is being fully funded by the parent. The next aspect is transfer pricing, right? So transfer pricing adjustments may be necessary for transactions between connected companies to ensure that companies cannot reduce their tax liabilities by using a transfer price that is below or above an arm's length price. Right? so you would have learned uh, either in, in mid stages, right? Not at the strategic level, but in the, the operational and the managerial levels, if you are a predominantly CIMA student, you have learned how transfer pricing works and it's ideally uh, the price at which internal divisions within the same group of companies do their deals with, right? Now in the context of capital structure, this means that if one company in a group has borrowed money from another company in a group, an adjustment will be necessary if it is deemed that the interest rate charged is not set at a market rate. So in the context of capital structure, one company in a group can borrow money from another company. So when that is done, what happens is in the, in the group accounts, an adjustment will be necessary if it is deemed that the interest rate charged is not set at a market rate. Because whichever that company is lending the money, right, giving the money might actually have a outside market rate at which they can give that money. Okay, where they, uh, uh, there are different means, right? They, they could even look at uh, certain other investments. So there is an opportunity cost involved in determining whether to finance. But the issue is this, when it comes to this transfer pricing model, what happens is think of it from the company's perspective that borrows. So would you want, if you are the borrowing company, we are in the same group of companies, would you want to borrow at a higher rate from outside or would you want to borrow at a decent rate from the inside of the company itself? 
and what exactly will the group the central group the parent company parents treasury function uh, decide is the most appropriate way forward right so these are all questions that we can ask ourselves surrounding the transfer pricing aspect and that brings me to the next aspect or next consideration country risk there will be less exposure to risk if an entity borrows funds in the country where it generates its net income any servicing costs for the finance can then be paid out of the income generated without worrying about exchange rate movements so depending on which country are we are based in the currency and even you know in additional you know there can be political risk economic risk other factors all of these factors can have a direct or indirect impact in terms of financing and as a result to our capital structure then the final consideration but important thin capitalization rules now when a company pays a dividend there is no tax relief for the payment right so dividend payouts there is no tax relief when it pays interest on borrowings the interest is tax allowable so if you are the company and if interest is tax allowable dividend is not what would you prefer so this means that companies would prefer to be financed through borrowings that is debt rather than through shares equity the thin capitalization rules aim to stop companies from getting excessive tax relief on interest thin capitalization rules to limit companies from making or rather getting excessive tax relief this occurs usually because they have entered into a borrowing with a related party that exceeds the amount a third party lender would be prepared to lend this occurs usually because they have entered into a borrowing with a related party that exceeds the amount a third party lender would be prepared to lend note that the additional borrowing is most likely to be provided by the parent company within a group structure so to avoid the impact of these kinds of situations and as a result from the company getting excessive tax relief we have or various regulators have thin capitalization rules and those are key considerations when it comes to capital structure it's not a really complicated idea the the thought process is that we we try and understand as case study students that we should be really good as especially senior finance managers we should be really good at determining which way to go right how to decide what is the best capital structure do we have 60% debt and 40% equity or do we have 20% debt and 80% equity this decision this is what capital structure is and it has a direct link to weighted average cost of capital and as far as the weighted average cost of capital is it's made up of cost of equity and cost of debt so now you have to think about the lenders cost of debt and the shareholders cost of equity and all the factors that are important related to cost of equity and cost of debt were what we looked at in this segment do keep working while having fun and on that note that marks the end of segment 2 part 2 I will probably see you soon in one of the next segments. Thank you.